pornography does train us to be self-centered, self-focused. It's about my pleasure. Over 50 years ago, uh, uh, a scientist named Tinbergen mm -hmm. did the whole butterfly experiment where he noticed that the male butterflies were attracted to the female butterflies, the markings on their wings and whatever. And so he made cardboard ones. But that were, that were super, super butterflies, right? And he put them up in the trees and he found that even though there were real female butterflies available mm -hmm. to mate with, they went to the cardboard yeah. ones. They went, yeah. tried to mate with the cardboard, the fake yeah. butterflies. And we see this over and over with war. You know, um, you become more attenuated. Sex becomes trying to mate with cardboard butterflies and with pixels on a screen. Welcome to another episode of Mental Health in the Age of the Metaverse. I'm your host, Christian Ulstrup. My guest today is Kristen A. Jensen. Kristen is the founder of Defend Young Minds, formerly Protect Young Minds, and the number one best-selling author of the Good Pictures, Bad Pictures series of books for parents, teachers, and mental health professionals. She is also the executive producer of the Brain Defense Digital Safety Curriculum, a powerful video-based course for families and educators. Kristen, welcome to the podcast. Hi, Christian. So so good to be here with you. Great to see you again. So thought it'd be good just to to dive right in. Um, I think you've you've got a very interesting, important, and unique mission that you're on. Um, what's your personal story, and uh, how'd you get started? Yeah, what's a nice girl like me uh, <laughs> thinking and writing and uh, working in this uh, kind of um, space? Mm -hmm. Well, I had no desire at all to do anything with pornography or, you know, in, in this space at all. But I moved to a new town. I met a woman. She had a large family. And she called me up one night and told me about her 17-year-old son, her oldest child, who they found out uh, was uh, sexually molesting his younger brothers and sisters. For, so from the 14-year-old all the way down to the four-year-old. He didn't get to the two-year-old. Um, and and uh, pornography was involved. And so I woke up the next morning and I just thought, what can be, you know, I just had this thought kept, like beating in my mind like a drum, like what can be done to warn young children before they get involved into pornography mm. and have these terrible outcomes because... This young man had to be separated from his parents, his family, and uh, thankfully there was a program for him here in Washington State. Mm -hmm. um, not every state has that, and uh, but there were really some bad outcomes for some of the other kids in the family. So um, anyway, I looked, tried to find a book because I thought, well, I'll buy a mm -hmm. book for because i have this belief that you know there's a book for every problem right and uh or many and so i thought oh there'll be a bunch of books on pornography and why it's bad for kids and especially and so i was looking and i couldn't find anything mm -hmm. and i started to do some research and and i came to the conclusion rather quickly that this wasn't rocket science it might be brain science but it could be boiled down for a young child, six, seven year old uh, child, to start to warn them about uh, some of the things they might run into uh, on the internet and how to respond mm -hmm. when they see those things. So that gave me the idea that, you know, when I couldn't find the book, I thought I'm going to write it myself. And I thought I could do it over the summer in a few weeks, but it took three years of research and testing and rewriting. Uh, but as soon as it came on, uh, it became a number one bestseller on Amazon. And um, then, I, then I was asked by parents to write a book for younger kids. So Good Pictures, Bad Pictures, Porn Proofing Today's Young Kids is for kids ages 7 to 11 in there. Although I've heard parents use it for older kids. Um, 
But uh, then I wrote one, uh, Good Pictures, Bad Pictures, Junior, A Simple Plan to Protect Young Minds. That's a read aloud book as well for kids ages hmm, three to six, seven, eight. Uh, and, uh, you know, I've read them to my own grandsons. So um, they just begin this conversation in a very comfortable way so that parents can start that conversation which ultimately is going to be very helpful and protective for their kids. Excellent. I, th- I think there's a lot to unpack here. Um, the, I think w- one of the, so in some ways, this is nothing new. We were talking about this a little bit before and that there's been erotic content through different media, really throughout human history. I mean, you can find, you know, old statues right, right from tens of thousands of years ago, but Things have changed in terms of digitization of of content, access, um, all that kind of stuff. And so uh, speaking personally, this wasn't much of a discussion that I had with my parents growing up, but clearly there's this this growing need that's being recognized by folks, including your customers, especially who are reading, buying, using the book. And it sounds like it started with um, you having some, some intuition or noticing that there was a link between consumption of adult content at an early age, especially, and then that moving from the online world to having these really devastating sort of catastrophic consequences in the real world. So that that link, I was wondering if you could unpack that a little bit, either in the context of what you had observed that got you started, or maybe more generally. Uh, yeah, so definitely. Well, um, just to go back to the books, I just want to say that there are three purposes mm-hmm. just to start yeah. off with in the books, and that is to give kids a definition so they recognize it, but an age-appropriate definition, to give kids a warning so they have a reason to reject it, and to give kids a plan so they know exactly what to do when they see it. So a, a definition, a warning, and a plan. And those are three things that are in both books uh, both good pictures, bad pictures books. Now, um, you, you talked about how this, this, you know, exposing children to pornography at a young age is doesn't just stay in the digital world. It 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 definitely bleeds over to the physical world, and I want you to think about children. When they are young, they imitate adults. They have an abundance of what we call mirror neurons that help children imitate. That's part of the reason. There's other things that mirror neurons do, but part of the thing is they they help children imitate. And every parent will definitely recognize this in their children. They see them, want, you know, little children like to help, you know, play with play vacuums or play with um, follow their uh, parent around with uh, a, a play or a toy lawnmower. You know, they like to imitate um, the actions of adults and also the phrases and the language and, and things. So we know this is true and this is how children develop. What happens with pornography is when they watch pornography, uh, they have unfortunately unprecedented access to it. And then they begin to, you know, many of them have um, a normal, natural, biological kind of push to imitate that behavior in, in a physical way. And so they will find someone with who is more vulnerable, younger, usually a younger child uh, in their family, in their neighborhood, uh, and and practice what they've seen. Um, and so this can have, like you said, devastating results on the family. Depending on the state you live in, this child-on-child harmful sexual behavior um, can get a child registered on a sex offender list for life. Um, They can go to juvie. Uh, There may not be any programs for them. Just 
it's the luck of the draw, depending on what state you live in. Um, one of the young, the children in this family that I just talked about, um, he grew up and uh, they found out that at the age of 21, he was offending on his very youngest sister. And um, he went to jail for that for six years. And there's no treatment in that state. Um, so not only that, just the devastation it has on, on the family relationships and the stressor and all that. So, you know, we talk about how pornography can become an addiction. Um, and that is really also has terrible, uh, you know, ramifications. But when you think about children acting out on other children, um, in a sexual way, this can be so harmful um, and, and just go on for years and years and years, that, uh, a lifetime of, of kind of pain and, you know, difficulty. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm horrified even th thinking about, you know, the, the case that you just described. Um, I guess the... To if I were listening to this right now as as a, a parent or really anybody, I think the assumption sort of in the culture right now is pornography is everywhere. It's ubiquitous. You know, there's some other stuff we can get into in terms of it being protected as free speech. Like, well, that, those are some bigger questions we we can kind of get to in a second. But the um, if I were hearing this, I would I might immediately react and say, well, that sounds like an extreme case. You know, I've been exposed to porn and I didn't go down that path. So, you know, what, what would you say to somebody who's, uh, who's, who's maybe not, um, quite convinced that this might be an issue? Is there any data? Or, right. Yeah. And I, sure. I get that. And I, I, I understand that. Well, I'll tell you this, um, about four years ago, my team and I, we helped to sponsor along with the national center on sexual exploitation um, and others, we helped to sponsor a symposium about child on child harmful sexual behavior, uh, in Washington, DC. And many people came to that from the military because they're finding, and they were finding, and this was in the news too, that this is a huge problem on military bases, the child on child, uh, harmful sexual behavior. And, um, so you wanted studies and backing those up. So they, there's a report in that was done a few years back in England that found that 65% of child sexual abuse cases were committed by minors. 65%. Mm -hmm. So we generally think that children are being, um, sexually abused by adults. And that definitely still happens. But it's shifting. Mm. It's shifting to children acting out sexually on other children. And, and so, and we're not just talking about, you know, a 16 year old and a 17 year old, you know, having sex consensually. We're talking about, you know, forced and, and rape, basically. So, um, another, uh, data point I guess I could give you is that there was a, there's a hospital in Kansas and the sexual assault nurse examiner, you know, manager, her name is Heidi Olson, by the way, she decided, she started to see these correlations between the kids that were coming in um, and the perpetrators being involved in porn. And also the fact that these kids went, you know, when they were perpetrated on, it was not uh, kind of the normal sexual thing you might, you know, like sexual exploration. It was definitely porn induced acts mm. that were being performed. So she started to do a study to document, you know, uh, the perpetrators. Basically, they would ask, you know, the parent or whoever brought the child mm. in you know, who did this and in the cases where they knew, and that usually was the case where they knew, um, they would find out. And what they found out is that 
the average, the largest group of perpetrators was, were males between the ages of 11 and 15. So, um, and again, they weren't just doing kind of normal things. They were doing porn-induced acts. So all of this, like, why is the largest group of perpetrators, why is that 11 through 15-year-olds, males? Um, there's a huge body of studies, a meta study that took it to, uh, that took 22 studies, pulled in all the data, analyzed it, and found that there's a huge correlation uh, between uh, males who watch pornography and there are six times greater chance that they will actually act out mm. uh, sexually really? or, you know, aggressively sexual aggression uh, on women. So it uh, there's just a lot of harms of children be having access to pornography. It creates greater sexual aggression. And there's study, there's a lot of studies on that. Um, I've just been reading a book by John Fober called Protecting Your Children from Internet Pornography. And he goes through tons of, of you know, studies on this and documents the harms of pornography. Um, for example, you know, anal sex is a huge thing in pornography. We've seen the rise of anal sex in kids. Um, and it's creating problems. Uh, especially in girls, they're having rectal damage. They're having higher amounts of rectal cancer um, at young ages, you know, that this shouldn't be happening. And uh, they're starting to tie that to uh, anal sex. So we know that, you know, there are problems with this. We just haven't been seeing them in kids and tying them to pornography. But I can me and many, many others can see um, the connections that are made. And it's not like, it's pretty reasonable. Again, yeah. kids act out what they see adults no, I, do. I mean, I think That's the, very I think normal. The first principles logic is, is pretty hard to argue with, right? Like kids are imitative, what they're, what they're going to see, you know, that would be reflected in the behavior. The stats you just shared, you said six times more likely uh, males are going to, yeah. Yes, so males that watch especially violent porn yeah. are six times more likely to act out or um, act out sexually in act out sexual aggression on women. Yeah. So I can get you the the actual yeah, study. We'll these in the show um, that's out of Australia, yeah. um, and you can link to it. But but. There's also studies, that sh there's just so many studies that show that even um, m men that look at porn um, are more likely to think that rape is not, like they'll do a study that will say, well, you know, in the crime of rape, how many years of jail time should you mm -hmm. serve? And, um, or should perpetrators serve? And the more porn they watch, the lower the jail time. Really? Yeah. So it's, that's an actual study. You know, there's, there's really a, a lot of irrefutable evidence about the, the link between pornography and sexual aggression. Very well documented. Not, you know, it's not out there and popular, you know, because no one wants to say that. It's just like nobody wanted to admit that, Cigarettes cause lung cancer, right. you know, smoking cigarettes, a big tobacco for a long time, denied that. And it took thousands and thousands and thousands of studies before, um, you know, it caught the attention of uh, the CDC yep. and they had the hearings and then they put the warnings on the, and they wouldn't let them advertise, you know, uh, and, uh, you know, in certain play, like on television. So there's, you know, we're getting there. We're getting there. So can I, can I play devil's advocate on just one point with the, um, uh, let's say like some of the studies that show the link between aggression and pornography consumption, how, 
how is it? And this might be something where we have to link to the studies or uh, is not available at the moment, but the, how do we know that there's a causal link as opposed to maybe somebody who's more aggressive is going to be correlation pornography? I've put together this five ways porn harms kids research mm -hmm. guide, uh, probably about five years ago. So this is not actually new research. Mm -hmm. Here's one thing. Kids emulate what they have seen done in porn. The impact of pornography on young people's sexual behavior has been most well documented with regard to anal intercourse. Anal intercourse is routine in representations of heterosexual sex and contemporary pornography with various studies finding its inclusion <clears throat> in 15 to 42% of the scenes. Five studies uh, among Swedish young people find that young men who are regular consumers of pornography are more likely to have had anal intercourse with a girl and to have tried to perform acts they have seen in pornography, and that girls who have seen pornography also are more likely to have anal intercourse. This is Flood, uh, Michael Flood from 2016. And then it actually can serve as, as what I say rape training. Quote, there is consistent evidence that exposure to pornography is related to male sexual aggression against girls and women. The body of evidence demonstrating this link is overwhelming with no fewer than three meta-analysis now available. Again, Michael Flood. Um, a new meta-analysis of pornography use and actual sexual aggression again demonstrates reliably, indeed undeniably, that pornography use increases the likelihood of perpetrating sexual aggression. This meta-analysis of 22 studies from seven countries comprising over 20,000 participants finds consistent evidence that pornography consumption is associated with acts of sexual aggression in both cross-sectional and longitudinal studies. In a recent longitudinal study of U.S. youth aged 10 to 15, with three waves of data over three years, individuals who intentionally consume violent X-rated materials were over six times as likely as others to engage in sexually aggressive behavior. Mm -hmm. After controlling for other potential influences on the association, individuals who saw X-rated materials in which a person was being physically hurt by another person while doing something sexual were still twice as likely to report sexually aggressive behavior in the past year. So it sounds like then both, both things... There's both a correlative, like there's an association okay. and maybe some lurking variable, which is you might, this is somebody for whatever reason is just more aggressive. And so they're more likely to pursue this kind of content, but also act out in real life. But then the last part I heard is there, because of it, there's this kind of uh, reinforcing potentially like the hypothesis would be that the content is reinforcing the offline behavior to the point that, did you say they were twice as likely when controlling? Yeah, they were still, so after controlling yeah. for other potential influences, yeah. right? They were still twice as likely to report sexually aggressive behavior in the past. Now that doesn't mean that everybody that watches violent porn is going to go out and be violent, but you start to accept because in pornography, women look like they're enjoying this behavior. They're enjoying being choked gagged, you know, and many other, uh, you know, pretty despicable acts. And so young men get this idea that, well, this is what women want. This is what they expect. This is what yeah. they like. Uh, it's not, it doesn't take, you know, I'm not the brightest candle on the cake, but I can figure that out. You, I can see the connection, um, why this would happen. And you hear a lot of anecdotal stories of men that, were choking women and when they got charged they're like well i thought she would like that <laughs> hmm, maybe Sorry. not so uh, that that's that there are just so many studies and but they don't get out a lot of these don't get out in mainstream because they're not the narrative yeah so that, that was a point i was going to go into is just like i think it's you know having if you really thought about everything that you just shared as as a sort of rational, um, the, you know, dispassionate kind of person, you may not be compelled that you fully bought the idea that there's a strong causal link quite yet, but you should at least be open to asking the question. 
I, I don't see how you can avoid Absolutely. that. And so I think, I do think it's interesting that um, there is seemingly so much resistance to, to asking these kind of questions. And you mentioned the narrative. I'm sure there's some other kind of interesting pieces and parts, but why, why does it feel like this is swimming upstream? Why is this such a difficult topic to, to broach? Yeah, because people associate pornography, pornography use with some kind of like sexual being sex positive. I think it's being sex negative, actually, because it teaches children these negative, toxic sexual, sexual scripts that don't lead them to having really healthy sexual relationships or relationship when they are older. Um, it just prematurely sexualizes them and then gives them this toxic sexual script uh, about what sex mm -hmm. is. And, um, you know, they've also done studies about the content of, of pornography and, you know, how much, how, you know, the percentage of scenes that are violent towards women and, um, I'm thinking of two different, you know, one that's older said 88% of the scenes were violent towards women, whether that's, uh, you know, verbal or physical aggression. Right. Um, but when you mix sex and violence, that ups the dopamine in right. the brain. So men will start watching kind of like vanilla porn, and then they'll quickly go to you know, a more deviant kind of porn because it becomes an addictive process and you're always having to up the ante to get that same level or close to that same level of arousal. And, you know, we we're talking about earlier how, you know, there's always been pornography, you know, you, you see it, uh, ancient Chinese paintings or whatever, you know, you, you, you see pornography, yes. But that's not the same animal. It's nothing even like what kids get access to on the internet. Um, and it's, you know, what we're seeing now is full color streaming video and endless novelty, yeah. which again propels addiction. Endless novelty. The brain loves novelty. I mean, if there's one thing that you can have endless novelty, it's porn. Uh, and so that seeking, you know, dopamine is that seeking molecule. And so there's just endless amounts. I mean, I've, you know, even on reels on Instagram, sure. you know, I'll get sucked sure. in, you know, from one to the next. And then my brain just loves, oh, what's the new thing? What's the new thing? What's the next new thing? And um, so our brains are un fortunately very vulnerable mm -hmm. to this kind of technology and when you think about sexual material uh, and and children their brains are not ready right. for to be sexualized they're not mature enough to make those decisions they're not ready and so uh, it's very unfortunate that children have this kind of access so, and there's something we can do about it i really do believe there's something we can do about it well, i think it. even thinking through if i can quickly try to summarize that sort of like behavioral you know loop or like pattern it would be that you're exposed to something that starts as maybe not particularly deviant because what you described right if you're imitating something that's more extreme that is it would be hard for me to imagine somebody immediately dives into that. Perhaps that happens, right? But you're describing more of this process of kind of going deeper and deeper, which has never been possible before because of the nature of digital media, where we now live in this world where there is a super abundance of information. In this case, incredibly powerful, compelling digital content, especially so to uh, somebody younger who doesn't have a fully formed kind of executive function um, system. And in order to keep the dopamine, you know, uh, getting it to that point that they originally got it to, they're going to sort of naturally veer into uh, content 
that could come back offline in very um, catastrophic ways. So it's that a process has never been possible before. Is that the key difference? Yeah, yeah, because, you know, when you think about, like, you know, when, when I was a kid, I saw my dad's Playboy magazines, okay? Now, I don't think that that was helpful for him. In fact, there's studies that show now that um, if you look at pornography, you're more likely, especially if you and your partner look at pornography, you're more likely, like three times more likely than couples that don't look at pornography uh, to to have infidelity in your relationship. So it just promotes all kinds of things. If you want your kids to grow up and have a chance at having positive, healthy, you know, long-term, even monogamous, which are the healthiest and the happiest uh, marriages, then, you know, you've got to steer them away from porn and you've got to teach them that porn is going to take them in the opposite direction of loneliness, of mm. addiction, and even, you know, s put them at a higher risk for criminal behavior. Um, so I don't talk about all that in good pictures, bad pictures, but uh, we do explain the process of addiction in clear, simple ways that children can understand. Mm -hmm. uh, we talk about the thinking brain and the feeling brain or Another term for that is the wanting mm -hmm. brain um, and, and how those two brains work and which brain needs to be have more control, mm -hmm. which is that thinking brain. But it's the thinking brain, that prefrontal cortex, the executive function, which is immature in, in kids. So they're far more vulnerable to seeing and being affected by pornography than you know, an adult that's 25 years old. I mean, if you're 25 years old and you see pornography for the first time, you have so much more ability to think about it rationally, to make choices, right. uh, and then and and not let it get to the point where it's going to become an addiction. Whereas kids that see it at nine, you know, they get sucked in, and uh, you know, if they're, it's just the perfect storm. Uh, set up for addiction and for these other problems. So um, on that point, you, you mentioned the age of nine. Is there, is there data on uh, how young people are being exposed to adult content now and what has been that trend? Okay, so there was first, uh, I believe in 2004, a study that said, you know, 11 years old was the average age the kids were getting. That's 2004. That's before the iPhone. That's before the iPad, uh, which came out in the iPhone in 2007, the iPad in 2010. Mm -hmm. And all of this access through apps, through social media, you know, all this access to pornography. So, um you know, I've heard people say that, oh, there's a study that showed that it was nine. Let me just tell you, this is a very difficult study to pin down. This very difficult, like, data point to pin down. Because what are you going to do? Go into a school and, you know, talk to all the kindergartners, first graders, second grade. Have you seen yes. porn? You know, have you seen naked people online? Have you seen, you know, uh, there's a point where the IRB, the organization that basically authorizes you to do a study um, will say yes to that. <laughs> it's very difficult. So it, it's a number that, you know, I've heard nine is the average, but I've heard so many stories of five-year-olds getting, uh, getting exposed to pornography on the school bus. Yeah. Seven-year-olds getting exposed, you know, in class uh, on the school computer. So, you know, it's very difficult to say what the average age is. You know, it's any kid that has access to the internet is vulnerable and they should be warned. So when parents say, well, what's the age that I should start talking about mm -hmm. this? I say, well, what's the age that your kid has any access to the internet? And if that's two, if that's three, you need to start those gentle conversations. 
uh, so that they know exactly you know what to do when they see a quote unquote bad mm-hmm. picture, when they see um, uh, pornography in any form. And uh, otherwise, I mean, we're, it, it's just, you know, no kid deserves to face the porn industry mm-hmm. alone. And they are, and they don't do well. I mean, I don't know about you, Christian, but when I'm caught off guard in a tricky situation by something totally mm-hmm. new, I don't tend to do very well if I'm not prepared. But kids that are prepared right. have that ability to do better, to make better choices, healthier choices, to protect and defend their own brain, their one precious brain. And um, and I have a couple of stories that kind of, maybe I could share a couple Please. of stories that, that kind of bring this point home. So um, I got uh, uh, contacted by a mom she was, she had a seven year old daughter and some older kids, and she was watching for the summer a 10 year old boy. His mom was a single mom. She worked during the day. When school was out, she needed, you know, childcare. So since their kids were friends, you know, she said, sure, I'll, I'll watch him for the summer. Well, the first month went by, it was totally fine. And then, an incident happened where this 10-year-old boy took her seven-year-old daughter into the bathroom and started trying to do sexual things with her. And the seven-year-old had been warned. She was able to communicate with the mother about what had happened. The mother called the boy's mother up and told her. And this boy's mother uh, you know, broke down in tears and said that three weeks prior, she had found on the child's, on the iPad yeah. that he was using, quote, pornography of every kind that he had been yeah. watching. So we don't know the exact timeline, but we do know that three weeks earlier, his mother had caught him watching this. And then three weeks later, after he was caught, he's, he acted out on this young girl this more vulnerable, younger girl. So that's one case where you can see, um, you know, and this is an anecdotal story, obviously, but uh, but, but if you talk to, for example, if you talk to therapists, if you talk to people who work in child advocacy centers, Mm -hmm. and those are the people that help, you know, children who have been physically, sexually assaulted, um, you will find that they know, that they see this correlation, that they see this tidal wave, you know, coming and how it is fueled by pornography. Um, but then another story. So another story, another couple mm-hmm. stories. A six-year-old uh, went, went with his family to a friend's home for dinner. And um, because this family was doing some uh, remodeling, mm-hmm. they had set, they put all this, the kids' toys down in the basement, right near the the stairs. And so this, the kids were allowed to go down, pick up a toy, come back up. So he was down there, you know, looking for a toy, trying to figure out which one he wanted to play with. When a man who actually lived down there, was renting, came up to him, you know, with his cell mm-hmm. phone and his smartphone and showed this boy, um, pornography, uh, gay porn, and um, said, hey, this would be fun to do. And it was starting this kind of grooming process. Uh, This little boy knew exactly what it was. His mother had read him good pictures, bad pictures. He recognized that's pornography Mm -hmm. and I should be looking at it. And I know exactly what to do. Um, He turned away. He ran upstairs. He told his mom. Now, Lots of kids get exposed to porn by perpetrators and they don't do that. They don't run immediately to their parent and tell because they haven't been taught to do that. But this boy was taught to do that. And I have so many more stories like this, but I just tell you that one, that the kids that are warned about pornography uh, because there's such a link between porn and child sexual abuse, um, that they are safer. Uh, from abusive situations and know how to kind of nip those in the bud to get out of there and and keep themselves safe. Um, 
One more story. A nine-year-old, uh, his mom read him good pictures, bad pictures, so he knew what pornography is, why it's harmful, what to do when, when he sees it. Three days later at school, uh, a classmate, uh, when they're on the playground, said, hey, look at this, and showed him pornography on his phone. And this child went home. Um, he knew what it was. <laughs> he recognized it. He wasn't caught off guard. Of course, he was surprised by it, but he, he knew what, what was happening. He went to his mom and told her and said, you know, I was scared, but I knew what to do. You know, I was scared, but I knew what to do. So I don't know what kind of porn this kid was being shown, but it was scary mm -hmm. to him. And he knew what to do as a result of being warned. So that's my message is like, talk to your kids early. Give them a chance. There's so much evidence that if kids don't know um, what they're dealing with, they won't, they won't tell their parents. They just won't. Um, uh, I had one parent tell me that um, her kids, she went to pick them up from a play date. Another child was showing them a phone in the front yard. They got in the car and she goes, well, what was she showing you on her phone? And these kids who had not yet been warned just looked at each other. They didn't even know how to describe what right. they'd seen. And so they said, uh, she was showing us a My Little Pony video. Well, months later, when this mom got a hold of Good Pictures, Bad Pictures, read it to her kids, they said, Mom, she wasn't showing us uh, My Little Pony. She was showing us pornography. And they lied because they simply didn't have the vocabulary right. or the right. permission right. to talk about this. And so we need to give kids a vocabulary. We need to give them the permission mm. to be open because this is a myth. If you think your kids are going to look at pornography and then come right to you and tell you um, and tell you what they saw, uh, there's just no evidence that that's going to happen unless you open that conversation first. So it sounds like the um, having that proactive conversation is is really the first step. And I want to couple that too with what we talked about in terms of seeming, seemingly decreasing age of first or potential first exposure. Again, it makes sense kind of intuitively because of the um, you know, uh, uh, spread of technology. I, I will say anecdotally, I do remember when we, one of my co-founders and I were looking at some of your content and we did some research to see, you know, like what is that first age nowadays? Because we're we're thirty, we grew up with technology. Like we're kind of on the the um, beginning of this wave. And I seem to remember there was something that was relatively up to date that said like, you know, forty percent or fifty percent of thirteen year old boys had been exposed to porn at some point. And we both immediately looked at each other and we're like, that's just that's just completely false. It is one hundred percent. It is one hundred percent. Yes, that's the thing. I. I feel like there is this disconnect, but the research is always trailing, you know, because if they're going to talk to like 30 year olds or 20 year olds sure. now, you know, now we're getting to the point where they can look back on their childhood and their childhood was, you know, they did have an iPad. There's a disconnect with parents too, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, there's many studies that show that what they call uh, this naivete gap. So what the parents, they, they, they underestimate the negative experience, experiences their kids are having on the internet. But they did a study recently at the British Board of Film Research, I think that's the name. They did a study where they asked a group of parents, you know, a lot of questions, but one of them was, have your kids seen pornography? 25% said, yeah, I think they've seen pornography. And 75% said, no. Okay. Well, then they asked those kids, like the kids of those parents, have you seen pornography? And it was twice as much as mm -hmm. they thought. So it was like over 50%, 53, 58% of kids said, yeah, I've seen pornography. And um, we also know that, I mean, some kids are not going to admit it, but at least 53% of those kids said, yes, I've seen, which means 
this is a huge gap uh, in in parents' expectations, and uh, and it, it was even worse for for uh, girls. So we have this myth that girls are not interested in sex. That's a total myth. It's just a cultural thing, you know. It's like, oh, girls should not be interested in sex. Um, if they're good girls, if they're nice girls, mm -hmm. you know, girls are just, can I just like newsflash? Girls are just as interested in sex as boys are. Mm -hmm. Okay. They just culturally, you know, are not supposed to show mm -hmm. that. So they do it in devious ways, but they get to it. They get to it. And a lot of girls uh, come into porn through erotic, you know, literature, but they, almost always end up in, you know, with video. 17% of the parents in that study said their daughters had seen porn when it was like 58%. Mm -hmm. So again, we need to be aware, more aware of what our kids, and I know it's hard because you don't want to think about right. this. So many parents, we, you know, we just love to hide our heads in the sand and think, well, you know, my kid would yeah. never do that. Right. My kid would not be interested in that. I've raised my child, whatever. I take my child to church every week, yeah. whatever. No, if your child is a biological human and has access to yeah. the internet, your child is at risk for seeing porn and being negatively impacted. Yeah. But again, there are things we can do about right. this. We can begin to arm our children with a disposition to reject pornography mm -hmm. with the ability, as, as they get to be 10, 11, 12, to be able to show them how porn sex is the exact opposite of healthy sex. Uh, I have articles about that on Defend Young Minds. And if we can have these conversations, you know, when they're very small, just to be protecting them so that they come to you and right. tell you. Um, and you know, I've had people say, well, your definition of porn for a kid is, is just nudity, mm -hmm. you know, and that's, that's not good. We don't want kids to, you know, think their bodies are bad. I'm like, no, we, we say in the books, all parts of your body are good. Even your private parts are all good. Um, but, but it's not safe to show pictures of your private parts to others or look at, look at that. Um, but I will tell you something, Christian. If your five-year-old is seeing nudity online, they're probably not looking at uh, the Sistine Chapel, okay? The, the ceiling, sure. right? Yeah. They're probably not looking at the statue of the David. Mm -hmm. um, they're probably seeing the content that you probably wouldn't want them to be right. looking at. So we have to educate them so that they know exactly what to do when they see it. And then you can be there with mm -hmm. them. You can be helping to shape that disposition mm -hmm. so that they understand uh, where this is going to lead. Now, they still have their choice. Um, and if, you know, you want to have all the filters, but you can't, you can't raise your kids right. in a bubble. Uh, you don't want to. But you want to raise them with the ability to make these, you know, healthier choices for their one precious brain. That's a really important point that context matters. And that's why this sort of age appropriate educational kind of approach, I think, I think makes a lot of sense. Again, thinking as a parent who's listening to this, it sounds like there's that first step, which seems pretty hard to argue with, which is that the reality of the situation is your kids could and probably will be exposed to adult content as you know information technology continues to be you know compelling accessible just omnipresent right that that kind of makes sense to me and i can understand why as a parent you'd be resistant one for generational reasons um somebody who's kind of like a millennial i i, I sort of find it hard to believe that they would not be open to this idea so that maybe that's changing, but the the other one that I can I can sort of understand or sympathize with is like you you outlined some pretty uh, described some pretty extreme consequences and like really catastrophic consequences of bringing extreme behavior back into the real world from the digital world. 
probably most parents and would be thinking and rightly so that their kid would never do that. Right. That's, that's not, that's not the norm. And that, I mean, that's, I, I understand like that, that impulse or that, um, response. And in most cases that is true. Um, however, uh, I guess the question I would pose to you then is, are there other consequences short of that, that I should be considering or, you know, concerned about? Right. So I think, um, I think, you know, if, if I'm a parent, mm -hmm. right. And I have, I mean, I have two daughters and I wanted them to grow up and at the right time and with the right person have a healthy sexual relationship. Mm -hmm. Um, and that was, you know, my wish and that was what I wanted. So I wanted to, uh, make, sh make sure that, um, they had some healthy information about sex before they got to that point. Um, unfortunately, kids are using pornography as sex ed mm. because it's, you know, there are so many parents, even today, even millennial, but you know, that are having a really hard time talking to their kids about sex. Mm. And, and so, um, um, I did a, I did a study myself, actually. It was more like a qualitative study where I, um, linked arms with a very educated and noted, um, uh, I could, well, person who was in a, a graduate program and he knew about this theory called, uh, jobs to be done. And basically the idea is that, that I was studying was why are kids hiring sure. porn? What job are they trying to get done that they go to porn mm. to do? Um, and so we actually dis, uh, we interviewed, um, and it was a specific kind of interviewing technique, but we interviewed 10 people who had identified as, you know, addicted to porn or in recovery. And it was eight men and two women. And the one thing, and we identified seven different jobs that they hired porn to do for them. And uh, it was very interesting. But the one thing that they had in common was that no one, when they were kids, no one had told them about sex. Their parents, right? They had to find out from other people. And, you know, today, kids, if you don't talk to them about mm -hmm. sex from, uh, in, uh, from an early age, they have options. They have, they have options. You know, they can go find out about sex from the internet and the Google and Snapchat. Um, heaven forbid that your child has Snapchat, but, um, <laughs> so much, so much grooming going on there. So much, uh, predation of children, sex exploitation of children going on in Snapchat, but, and Instagram. But, okay, so getting back to some of the, you know, lesser, you know, let's say your child doesn't act out on another mm -hmm. child. Um, but there's also studies that show that children that, especially girls that look at pornography, are they're kind of like groomed, right? So they're more likely to be sexually active mm -hmm. at younger ages and be willing to uh, engage in uh, more risky behaviors. Um, so that's one, you know, mm -hmm. problem. Let's talk about, uh, so, so this idea that, that pornography will hijack their sexual scripts. Mm -hmm. Pornography will teach them about sex in a way that is very unhealthy and that does not lead them to having healthy relationships, stable marriages, um, or even the ability to relate to, you know, if you're a man, to relate to women in ways that are not objectifying, mm -hmm. right? Um, we talk about objectification a lot when we talk about pornography. And I just think the word objectification is not like, it needs to be always followed with or, you know, linked with dehumanizing because objectification is dehumanizing. When you look at a person, and they're just a compilation of body parts, right? Um, that, you know, 
that is dehumanizing. And if you teach your brain um, to dehumanize women or men and and make them just objects, you know, I te- in in the book, Good Pictures, Bad Pictures, we talk about this on a very age appropriate way. But, you know, if you have an object like a ball, you can kick the ball. Ball is not going to cry, right? Um, the ball is not going to be hurt. But if you kick your friend, you know, they might be, they would be hurt. Uh, and they, and physically and emotionally. So I think that, um, this objectification and, and it's teaching kids to objectify themselves, to dehumanize themselves, mm. to think that their only worth or their greatest worth is in how they look, not, you know, their contributions to society, not their intelligence, not their wonderful sense of humor, uh, not their ability to show love and kindness. That's your goal. Then pornography, you know, you don't want pornography to be a big influence on your children. Do you think there's any merit to the argument that porn is good? Uh, I've looked at this and, um, I think if you go deep into the foundation, deep into the the kind of the philosophical orientation of what pornography does mm-hmm. for people, um, I would say mm-hmm. no, because I think it's a counterfeit. Mm-hmm. So what? why do you watch pornography? You watch pornography to get sexually aroused or maybe to learn how to have sex or to learn what to expect yeah. um, in sex, right? Well, I've already talked about how that is, you know, teaching kids like the wrong thing. I think it's it's very toxic uh, way to look at sex because so much of pornography is um, misogynistic. Mm-hmm. It's so, uh, you know, women getting choked and gagged and, um, you know, other really degrading acts. Um, I don't know how much you want me to get into this with your audience. I would be happy to describe some of those. I generally don't because I talk to parents and I don't want to like totally freak them out. But um, it gets gets really bad and disgusting. Um, And nothing that you would think is going to lead to a healthy, happy sexual union (laughs) why do you go to porn it's to get sexually aroused and there are so many men that say i can't even have sex with my wife or my girlfriend without having a porn loop right i become dependent Mm. upon Mm. porn to sexually arouse me i can't and this leads to the whole sexual dysfunction uh so this porn tying a few years ago to this big front you know cover article on why men are trying to quit porn because it's led them to sexual dysfunction Mm -hmm. and they've gotten so addicted so topped out that now their brain can only arouse them sexually with because porn is a super stimulus and they can only be aroused by the super stimulus the normal kind of sexual arousal that you would get with a normal, you know, maybe even be- your your wife is beautiful in every way, um, but she, you know, you can't like uh, get aroused or get an erection with her, um, but you can with porn, and that's called porn induced erectile dysfunction. And there's more and more light being shown on that. And that's one of the, another reason why pornography is a public health crisis. I think that uh, you're, and there, there's a lot of uh, statistics showing that pornography among, I mean, erectile dysfunction among young men has ballooned like a thousand percent in a 15 year period. Yeah. So it used to be like, maybe like, you know, Men in their 20s and 30s, you know, maybe 2% of them had erectile dysfunction. Mm -hmm. You know, now it's ballooned to like 30%. Now, erectile dysfunction in older men is a vascular Mm -hmm. problem. 
Now, there are some young men that are definitely overweight, and it could be a vascular problem. But generally, um, we, you know, what they're finding is um, it's also a por- it's a pornography problem because you really can get. And Gabe Deem and a few others have really um, spoken out about this, and they have groups uh, on Reddit groups, and they have uh, websites that help men, you know basically stop masturbating to porn and to get their uh, ability to have a sexual relationship back with their wife because it's devastating. If you have a girlfriend, wife, whatever, that that you can no longer have sex with because uh, porn, <laughs> and that, that can be pretty devastating to mm-hmm. the man and to the, you know, to the relationship. So, so there's that. There's a, there's sexual dysfunction, um, most noted in men, but I have seen now evidence, or I have now heard of it in women as mm-hmm. well. So um, I, I just feel like there's no co- so back to the question: Is pornography can pornography be mm-hmm. good? Um, I, and you have people say, "Well, wait a minute, there's this female friendly porn." I just wrote about this on on Defend mm-hmm. Young Minds. See, I really feel like the best sex, the most healthiest sex is within a relationship mm-hmm. where you love the other person. <laughs> what a concept. Where you're thinking about their, you know, their pleasure mm-hmm. and where you want to do for them. And it's this wonderful bonding experience. Yeah. Um and I think that is the best case because that's real. That's real. Now you have people watching porn, having sex with robots, uh, with VR, right? And they have like devices hooked to their genitals so that it can be coordinated with the VR and what's happening uh, in that. And it's such a fake yeah. thing. Um, you can't like... I don't know. I've been sick and my husband takes care of me. <laughs> um, my husband's been very sick and I've taken care of him. I mean, I've pretty much saved his life, I think. Um, and so, you know, you're not going to get that with the digital relationship. I don't think that because per- porn is about performance. Yes. You are watching a performance. Yeah. It means sex is a porn says sex is all about performance. Mm-hmm. Okay. That's how it sets it up. That's what it teaches your brain. It's about your performance. It's about your pleasure. Mm-hmm. And, um, whereas in a relationship, it's about, um, you know, caring for the other mm-hmm. person and trusting them. And it's just, so if I have to watch porn to be able to somehow improve my sex mm-hmm. life, then what is my sex life based on? It's based on performance. It's not based on a relationship. So I think that the best sex is based in a relationship, a good relationship. And I think porn, whether porn you know, takes us away from that. And again, I cited that study where they found out that in this study, at least the people that watch porn together, like, oh, we're going to watch it together, um, had three times more uh, infidelity, three times higher risk of infidelity in that relationship than people that did not watch porn at all. So you're, you're just uh you, you see what it leads to and and this is very yeah. interesting i think you know some of the language you use calls to mind issues that are really top of mind for me and my co-founders that we've seen crop up in other um digital media arenas where there seems to be this common unifying root issue which is that it's once uh, excuse me, once a particular behavior or feedback loop or use case um, inevitably points you towards self-orientation rather than 
like what you're describing this alternative where it's, it's not subject object, which is, I mean, this is like, like clinical narcissism, right? Is seeing everyone else as an object for your particular selfish ends. Uh, I mean, yeah. And has narcissism been going up? Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, Go ahead. I, I think these things are related and it's kind of, it's kind of interesting. It's like the, you know, you contrast that with what you're talking about, um, which is, is having that subject subject, you know, intersubjective relationship. Um, that's something that is more, um, obvious or accessible. I'm not quite sure what the right word is, but reality as a medium it, that, that becomes kind of more the norm. Whereas with digital media, it seems like it's, there's this, there's this, uh, ever present issue of veering into this self-oriented, um, world or relationship with objects or with simulations or even with, you know, uh, other, other people, um, in, in some, in some cases. So yeah, I just, I'm, I wonder what you think about that. That's sort of like self versus, uh, self-oriented versus kind of like intersubjective mindset. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think everything I've said kind of yeah. goes to that, that, that pornography does train us to be self-centered, self-focused. It's about my pleasure. It's about, you know, how can I get aroused? Uh, and how can I find, you know, and it's that seeking behavior where, you know, um, over 50 years ago, uh, uh, a scientist named Tim Bergen mm -hmm. did, you know, the, the whole butterfly, you've heard of this, the whole butterfly experiment where he took, he noticed that the male butterflies, you know, or moth were attracted to the female butterflies, the markings on their wings and whatever. And so he made cardboard ones, but that were, that were super, super butterflies, right? And he put them up in the trees and he found that even though there were real women, not real women, real female butterflies available mm -hmm. to mate with, they went to the cardboard mm -hmm. ones. They went, tried to mate with the cardboard, the fake mm -hmm. butterflies. And we see this over and over with war. You know, um, you become more attenuated, more sex becomes basically uh, trying to mate with cardboard butterflies and with pixels on a screen. And you're teaching your brain that that, and, and especially when you teach your brain at a very young age, that, that is what mm -hmm. sex is. It's not so easy to, it's possible. I know it's possible, uh, but it's a process to train your brain that, you know, sex is something different and it's a mutual uh, thing. And it's not, it's, it's, it's other focus. It's, you know, the best situation in a marriage is where, you know, um, one partner is really focused on the other's pleasure and the other partner is focused on this. So it's this mutual, I want you to have a wonderful experience and you want me to have a wonderful right. experience. Well, that's not taught in porn. And um, so unfortunately, we see that pornography is a super stimulus because of um, the novelty effect and that it will lead people, you know, from like vanilla porn down to extreme kinds mm -hmm. of porn. And so you have all these fetishes and people just keep searching and searching and it just gets that dopamine. But what happens in the brain is that when there's huge amounts of dopamine released across those yes. neurons, and in the synapses, you know, across the synapses, um, the receiving neuron, you know, has these receptors for mm -hmm. dopamine. But when there's a flood of dopamine, the neuron like knows, like, wait, too much dopamine. It's kind of like, you know, when you hear a loud sound and you just clap your, you know, you put your hands over your ears, like, wait, that's too mm -hmm. loud. So it, it does that. It says, wait, that's too loud. And it shuts down those receptors. So now, where you had, you know, I'm just making this up, 100 receptors, maybe now you have 70 receptors. Yeah. 
Well, 70 receptors are not going to get as much dopamine. So now you got to push more dopamine and you'll never really, you know, you always, you're always chasing that high. And, and so you have to have ext- more extreme porn. Um, and it just leads people down this addictive, uh, you know, I say super highway where they are just becoming more addicted and, uh, to look to chasing that that Mm -hmm. high um and so you know there's a lot of arguments like oh pornography isn't addicting um (laughs) there's so many so and we haven't talked about this but the mri Mm -hmm. studies that show that pornography is it is acts just like any other addictive drug or chemical or substance so they've done these mri studies that show that for example, the reward center in your brain. Uh, wh- a typical thing about an addiction is that um, that you become more sensitized. So let's say both of us are driving down the road in a car, and you you happen to be addicted. Or well, I'll make it me. I don't want to say anything bad about you, Christian. Uh, I'll just let's say I'm the addict. Let's say I have an addiction to alcohol, and we both see a big billboard. And the billboard is advertising, you know, vodka or whatever. Let's say it's advertising my favorite alcoholic beverage. Well, your brain probably won't really react Mm -hmm. to that. The reward center will not really light up. My brain will be like a Christmas tree. Wow, you know, oh, man. And so you become sensitized to uh, sexual Mm -hmm. cues, much more sensitized. And then... um. And so they've done studies, F- F- functional MRI studies, where they can see the brain lighting up the different areas of the brain. And they can tell that when you show uh, someone who's addicted to porn or uses it compulsively, heavily, you know, daily, whatever, versus someone that doesn't use it very often, um, they see those same patterns uh, the brain of the pornography, the compulsive user or the addict lights yeah. up um, and the, uh, the healthy individual does it. Um, they've also seen it with uh, anticipation. Again, there's so many studies that show that pornography acts like an addiction, just like you can get addicted to gambling. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, uh, you can get addicted to behaviors. Um, the American... Uh, the American Society of Addiction Medicine, ASAM, uh, in, like 11 years ago, they rewrote their definition of addiction to include behavioral addictions. So they, they said, yeah, you can become addicted to alcohol and cocaine and meth and even food, mm-hmm. right? Sugar, whatever. Uh, and you can become addicted to gambling, shoplifting mm-hmm. and sexual things like porn. So uh, it's coming to be where you can see it's just this mounting studies showing that pornography addiction is real. It it makes me think of, um, there's a, there's an (laughs) interesting thinker uh, named Terrence McKenna, uh, who was, he's he's really out there kind of guy. was um, into like psychedelics and like all kinds of wild stuff but he was he was uh, very much like a um would think a lot about the future of of technology and what it was going to mean for the 21st century i think he died in the late 90s but um he had this interesting quote about you know in the future uh computers will become drugs and the drugs will become computers and sort of in anticipation of there being some kind of you know digital experiences digital information could be so compelling that somebody's own experience or even what you would see, like you said, in the functional MRIs and everything else, it, there's really no difference versus uh, smoking or snorting or injecting something, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah. And it sounds like that's, that's uh, um, you know, some of, unfortunately, what we're seeing sounds like crop up in, you know, both the, uh, I think we've talked about the qualitative and anecdotal data, but also in, in some of these studies and whatnot. Um, on this point of public health, you frame this as a public health issue. 
And this is this is where I think this gets very interesting because there's there's another sort of um, you know when it comes to uh, state intervention or, or sort of the public sphere, we have different values, right? And as Americans, there are certain things that we value. The First Amendment is all about free speech. We care very much about freedom. Um, at the same time, kind of you know the public health. Like I think there, there's a good quote. I think it was from Cicero or something about this. It's like the public health should, or uh, the health of the public should be like the supreme law or something, right? So that's, that's sort of in the sphere of um, uh, government or the state. Um, there was, there are some lawmakers who have floated the idea of uh, banning pornography entirely, something I've sort of seen cro- crop up in the Twitter sphere. Um, but, but even short of that, thinking of this as a public health crisis is kind of a, or a public health issue would invite um, uh, so some, you know, policy making like intervention. Um, do you think that there's a role to play for, you know, the government, whether it's at the local or, you know, whatever, whatever sort of level, but, uh, public policy when it comes to, um, this kind of content? Yeah. Well, even free, even free speech is limited. Mm-hmm. You know, we've got hate speech laws now we've got, uh, you can't re- you, you know, you can't yell fire in a crowded uh, theater. Um, if there's no fire, you can't, you know, there, there, there are some limits on our, our mm-hmm. speech. So um, am I out there trying to ban pornography for everybody? Mm-hmm. No, I'm not. Okay. No, I'm not. That's to me, that's not my main goal. Um, what I would like to see though is us as a society recognizing the damage that pornography is doing to the the children and i would like to see a modulation i would like to see a balancing so that we say okay people can still get their porn adults can still get their porn if they want but we are going to do some things to protect minors Mm -hmm. from it obviously Savvy kids can find, you know, but we're going to make it a little more difficult because so many children, I think it's, I've seen statistics like, you know, two thirds or 67% of kids come across pornography, uh, you know, accidentally. So it's pushed, it's being pushed to them and they come across it because they click on a link or they're in a game and they click on an ad and, you know, this kind of thing. So uh, we would like to at least do do that for children. Now, um, you know, we made these laws about, all right, you can't mm-hmm. drink legally. You can't go into a store and legally get alcohol, right, until you're a certain age. You can't buy cigarettes. Now, does that mean that no minors ever get alcohol or cigarettes? No, but it's a little harder for them. And it, the culture is basically saying, um, we know that this is harmful for children, so we're going to make some laws. And there are some laws that are starting to be uh, put forward that would have age verification uh, so that, um, you know, you would have to, if you are a porn site, you would have to do something uh, more than just a button that says, I am over 18. <laughs> uh, you would have to actually verify yeah. that that person is over 18. And there are some pretty, you know, we can do this. We can, do, the technology is there. We can do it. Uh, it's just the will. And I would love to see that because it would mean that our culture is, is finally recognizing like porn is harmful for children and we want to protect children from it. Um, so that they can grow up with healthy sexual scripts and not, you know, toxic ones that we see in pornography. Um, I would love to see the adults in this country say, you know what, I'll, I'll give up a little bit of my, um, or I'll, I'll jump over one little hoop, uh, so that children, you know, to get to my porn so that children can be protected from mm-hmm. it. And I would love to see our society recognizing how important 
um, I mean, we're going to face a tidal wave of, of re- we already are uh, repercussions from children accessing pornography. And um, we're going to continue to see these, you know, the skyrocketing amounts of child on child, the harmful sexual behavior, like we talked about. We're going to start to, we're going to be seeing the addiction uh, issues. I mean, it, we're already seeing that 50 to 60% of marriages that break up, uh, one of the major factors that they, you know, say is part of their breakup is an internet addiction, internet addiction mm-hmm. to porn. Uh, so when you see, when you're talking about public health crisis, when you see that pornography is one of the major factors contributing to divorce, mm-hmm. um, I don't know about you, but my parents were divorced and um, then, sub, you know, then I got s- step parents and then they were divorced. I mean, I grew up with divorce and I'll tell you, it was not, it's not a healthy thing. It's not positive for right. children. Uh, but yet here's something that is really contributing to divorce um, and that is uh, pornography addiction. So, um <sighs> Freedom of speech, yeah, sure, I love it. But uh, at some point, we have to protect the children. Let's at least protect them from pornography like we protect them from cigarettes, you know? So, Let's at least do that yeah, much, so you know? Make it hard for them to get. A little bit, um, because that's that, that I think is very interesting, because it's like you had um, people for a long time thought that smoking cigarettes was not a problem, um, but you also <laughs> that it was good for, good your, for throat. your throat, right? Doctors, <laughs> doctors lied, or yeah. whatever it is, right? Um, so <laughs> that that's interesting, though, because there was in that case there was a significant industry. Same thing is true for gambling and and um, you know alcohol, so called like vice vice indu- or vice industries or whatever. Um, in the case of pornography, I'm realizing I'm actually personally basically completely ignorant of the uh, economics or um, kind of the business of it. Is there an analog or an equivalent of like big porn <laughs> that you're up against? Absolutely. Really? Absolutely. Um, so, you know, used to be pornography was sold, you know, in magazines, sold in like, you know, VHS tapes, you know, and there are some people that argue that all this technology, VH- VHS tapes, CDs, DVDs, whatever, I mean, DVDs, not CDs, um, was developed to actually spread pornography. Um, I wouldn't argue with that, Um, but um, you had to go and get it. And but now with streaming, it changed the whole business Mm -hmm. model. So there used to be this business model of you had to like directly pay for it. But now it's all on like tube Mm -hmm. sites where you can get it for free. But there's all this advertising. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Pornhub and other, other X hamster and all these other sites, you know, are using a different business model and it's allowing more access to children. Um, and it is, uh, it's hugely profitable. I mean, stream, because what you have people uploading pornography. Like with YouTube, you know, people uploading mm-hmm. videos, they make a little bit money, but you know, we know YouTube makes a lion's mm-hmm. share. And, um, so Pornhub has been a, the leading, you know, tube site for pornography, making billions and billions of dollars. And they're not ver they weren't verifying that, uh, this girl that looks to be 12 isn't 12. Uh, She's just an 18 year old that looks like 12. You know, they, they actually had rape, uh, you know, film. They film a rape and put it up on porn to make money. I mean, this is something they had to take. So, uh, there was a lawsuit. They had to take down 10 million videos just in the last year or two. 10 million yeah. videos. Because those videos couldn't be verified that they weren't rape videos of that minors. Case, that, that, that is, what does that say right. to you? <laughs> the, okay, so so I want to back up for a second. 
these companies are now with streaming, you said it was advertising driven? Yeah. Well, basically you can get on, you can get a premium membership to get access to premium material. Um, but you can go to Pornhub and watch it for free. I mean, yeah, they put you through, I'm over 18, but I mean, you can right. set up an account. Any eight year old can set up an account. Um, and, um, and or just go there and uh watch all this free content you have some of these larger mainstream companies but think of all the credit card companies that Mm. you know when you get to the point where a lot of people will pay for like like youtube right you can get the premium youtube experience without all the ads it's like eight bucks a month or something Mm. like that well Pornhub has the same thing and who processes all those, you know, finances. So recently, I'm pretty sure one of the major credit card, you know, um, companies pulled out of that. But um, we just have to see that. And I've written about this on on Defend Young Minds, that it's big business and parents need to understand that it's big business and it is, you know, they want to get customers younger and younger hooked so that when they can pay, they will pay. So, I think one of the things that's so interesting about the whole business model of, of you know, because people would be watching these videos and just think, oh, it's all these little people making these videos, you know. But what they didn't realize is it's all funneled through, you know, a few different companies. You know, Pornhub is owned by... Pornhub is owned by the same company that does X Hamster, I believe. So it's like they own all these sites yeah. and they're making these big, you know, huge amounts of money. And so it's not a disparate, yeah. like little, oh, it's like not mom and pop. It's actually big, big business. It's a, so you're saying you it's know, more, it's more, you know, YouTube is user generated oh, yeah. content. Like there's a lot of organic stuff. You're saying that's not yeah. the case in the adult. I'm saying that the money is being made by a few companies. They're making most of the money. But I think, you know, when when you boil all this down, when you think about the potential harms to children, um, whether it's, you know, their, their sexual scripts get hijacked by pornography, they aren't able to have healthy relationships as adults, um, they uh, may imitate the behavior they see, and that could lead to disastrous results for mm-hmm. them um, as, you know, children, um, even, you know, prosecuted uh, criminal kinds of things. Um, you know, the risk is just too large. So we need to, you know, we can't just keep handing our children the phones and the iPads and everything out without some digital right. training without some digital safety right. training. I mean, you would, I bet your parents didn't hand you the keys to their new car or any of their cars when you were 10 and say, go take it for a spin. Have fun, you know, check it out, explore, right. see what's out mm-hmm. there, mm-hmm. you know? No, because they know that the, you know, the, the chances that you could get hurt or hurt somebody mm-hmm. else we're about a hundred percent. So, um, we, but we, we give kids these devices. We let them have these apps. We, you know, games, access to the internet without giving them any kind of safety training before we do that. And so what Defending Minds is trying to do is help parents, um, prepare their children to thrive in the digital age. We know all these problems are not going to go away instant, you know, anytime soon. So let's at least arm our children with knowledge, with skill sets, with dispositions, mindsets, so that they can uh, deal with this kind of, the, you know, pornography and also predators, you know, sexual exploitation. Um, be able to avoid those things um, and grow up and thrive in the digital age, 
taking advantage of all the wonderful mm -hmm. things that are out there, the positive things about technology without being hurt by them. And so, you know, we are working to um, develop more and more resources. You know, we've got our books, Good Pictures, Bad Pictures, and Good Pictures, Bad Pictures, Junior. And then we've developed the uh, Brain Defense Digital Safety Curriculum, which is video-based. It's like, you know, one uh, press and play. You know, it's really easy for parents to to it's uh, play a video, have kids do, you know, fill in some worksheets and have discussions. We have discussion prompts, role plays. Um, so parents can, and also for teachers, but we have definitely... Um, have a version for families of brain defense so that they can begin to give their kids um, digital safety training from a young age. So we would say definitely by the age of seven, you can start this uh, brain defense mm -hmm. with them. And uh, I, I just really feel that <laughs> we're throwing kids out yeah. there and kind of crossing our fingers. Right. And we're also thinking back like, oh, well, it wasn't that bad when I was a kid growing up. Um, I didn't, but every year things change and get worse for kids. So let's give them a chance and give them some digital safety training. Um, so I would invite, you know, everyone listening to go uh, check out Brain Defense on our website at defendyoungminds.com. We've priced it so that it's very affordable. And, um, you know, we've, we've piloted it and kids love it. Parents love it. Teachers love it. Um, and it just can start those conversations. They're so helpful and healthy for kids. And so, and, it, and it's not just about porn. That's just one of the topics. We cover, you know, technology habits. We talk to kids about, you know, the three C's, choosing your content wisely, controlling your screen time, um, and creating a mm -hmm. balance of, you know, digital versus in real life. Mm -hmm. So all of those things are talked about. We talk about bullying. We talk about predators. We talk about uh, just being a good digital mm -hmm. citizen. And so all those things are in uh, brain defense and uh, curated and based upon the best science available. Uh, to back it up. So, awesome. yeah. And I know you put brain defense. years, years and years <laughs> of work in yeah. that. So the brain defense curriculum, we're going to link to, and that's for educators yeah. and also for parents. Um, in addition to, obviously you have those books. One, one thing I wanted to call it to, I, you know, really caught my attention was you, you mentioned that you changed the name of the company from uh, protect young minds to defend young minds, which I thought was very interesting. Yes. And yeah. I, I, I'm curious if you could elaborate on that a bit. So, yeah. Yeah, protect is a great word. Parents love the word yeah. protect. We all want to protect our kids. But uh, I was always, there are a lot of people that kept saying, yeah, but you really can't protect kids. They're mm -hmm. going to see mm -hmm. it. I'm like, yeah, but what I mean is protect them from the ill effects by educating them, mm -hmm. da, 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 da. And uh, I had so many parents also start to write and say, I tried to protect my kids, but I couldn't, mm -hmm. right? And And so we just felt like, you can always defend your children and you can teach your children digital self-defense right. skills, digital self-defense. And so that's why we went to defend because you do need to defend your children. You need to teach them to defend themselves. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, when you think about protection, meaning, you know, uh, exposure, their kids you're not going to be able to protect, you know, from exposure. Um, unless, like I said, your child doesn't see, um, doesn't hear. Um, but um, most children are going to get exposed. This idea of persuade, educating and persuading your right. children, giving them a disposition yeah. and an understanding as they grow increasing that education as they grow up so that they have the tools and the mindset and they know how to reject pornography and they want 
to reject mm-hmm. pornography. You know, no filter is going to be able to, uh, you know, influence the heart and the mind and the soul of your mm-hmm. child. You mm-hmm. can do that. You mm-hmm. can do that uh, with, with, and, and you can do that without our tools, but, but we have put them there to make it so much easier. And, uh, we've curated all of this. We're, we're out there looking at all these things, reading about all these things so that we can, you know, give you a curated, um, access to it, make it easier for you because you're busy. I get it. You are very, you know, parents are very busy these days and it's, it's tough. So, you know, go to Defend Young Minds and, uh, we also have free guides that you can download. We have some guides that are a very nominal uh, charge, but they're all there to help parents kind of get up and mm-hmm. running with mm-hmm. this problem and begin to educate themselves and then empower their children to reject pornography and its lies because pornography promises a lot of things and it doesn't deliver. It delivers the opposite of what they promise in the mm-hmm. long run. And our kids will be so much healthier for it if we can steer them away from pornography. Education is cre- is key. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, education, yeah, and persuasion. And persuasion. Yeah. And a good way to get started is is with the uh, content that you highlighted. Um, Kristen, before I, I let you go, I was wondering, do you have time for one more question? Okay. So... This is sure. one I've, I've been having a lot of fun asking the guests because the the answers uh, vary quite a bit. <laughs> um, but you know, we talked about uh, quite a bit about the past and and uh, the present, and a little a little bit about the future, where things are going. Now, if we go kind of really far out into the future, let's say eight, ten years, we've got the confluence of all these different technologies that are making digital media, um, good, bad, and the ugly, more accessible, more compelling. Just sort of. Seems to be is what it is. You've got virtual reality. You've got artificial intelligence. You know the the digital drugs are getting stronger uh, in some ways. Um, but you know this is this is continue. This is a continuing trend. And so this this um, there's a very interesting question, sort of philosophical but also practical that that comes up, which is you know in a world where uh, the line between reality and virtual reality is quite blurry. Like, can you still make a case for reality? Which seems absurd, but is, I think, an important question. Like, why does reality still matter in that kind of world? Yeah. Well, that's a great question because, you know, with people that didn't grow up with the digital Mm -hmm. world, Mm -hmm. really, except for TV, (laughs) um, you know, we see this clear divide. Uh, but kids that are growing up now, I mean, it's all one yep. thing, you know, they don't, they don't see this clear divide between digital, their digital friends and their real friends. You know, they, they see it's all real to them. It's all, you know, so we kind of have to make these, dis, you know, this uh, distinguish between, well, your digital friends and your in real life friends that you go, you know, play baseball with or, you know, go shopping with or whatever. Uh, and, um, so the case for real things, I think there's a very strong case for real things. Um, and we have to temper and balance the digital. Uh, we don't want it to take over. Um, there, I was talking with a pediatrician recently who is over a lot of the military bases in, in Asia. And he said, well, it used to be, you know, when kids in the military, they would move every three years, they'd have to be uprooted, they'd go to their new place, and they would start making new friends. And they had these amazing skills um, that they would make new mm-hmm. friends. And if you met, ever met any, anybody that grew up mm-hmm. that way, you could tell that they're really good at getting in, talking to people, you know, making friendships. And... um and they have a they have a certain confidence too, which sometimes got mislabeled as arrogance, but they have a certain confidence. Um, but now he said what kids with their electronics are doing is they're going to the new base and they're just hanging out digitally with their new with their old friends and not making new friends. And it's retarding some of their social development. 
So again, social development, it's important to have real friends. And then the opportunity for bullying, for um, attacking each other. Um, I think so many times it brings out, you know, we know of all these stories of kids that committed suicide because they were being bullied. And, you know, when I was bullied as a kid, my mom would just say, I'll kill him with kindness. But see, I could go home to my mom and she could give me this kind of pep talk, but I didn't have social media following me, Mm -hmm. you know? And I didn't have that, the threats and the, you know, you were talking about how uh, the digital world is just making um, it more accessible, but also more compelling. Well, you know, that's also what's happening with, you know, these negative things. Uh, They're becoming more, more widespread. So... I think it's a challenge to parent children in these days. And that's why it's so important for them to have a chance by being educated and being uh, taught these digital safety skills so that, and so that they know you have their back and that you understand, you know, a little bit about what they're going through to fight against this. You know, we talked about um, the naivete gap to get yourself educated so you aren't caught by what you don't know you know that your children aren't hurt because you just weren't aware of the danger yeah i mean reality matters maybe for the simple fact that it just cannot be avoided (laughs) you know in the in that that case of uh, current naivete that's kind of what what comes to mind i know a, a, a 30 year old who um is you know has a studio apartment and with covid had to come home and do her job, you know, in her little studio mm-hmm. apartment. And she also plays games, you know, so she had gamer mm-hmm. friends, but she didn't have a lot of like real friends. But she found a real friend that lives in her own apartment complex um, and it works that she mm-hmm. works with. And um, so I recently had a conversation with her because she's looking to kind of move into a bigger apartment. And, um, and she said something interesting. Um, she said, well, I think I'll stay at this complex because of this real friend that I have here because they get together, you know, and do things together. She'll give her rides to places. And I thought that was so yeah. interesting because the power of this one friendship is going to dictate really where mm-hmm. she lives. Because she does not want to leave that yeah. friendship, um, and uh, you know, I th- saw that as a positive thing for her that she had this friendship, and um, that she still want you know wanted to be close to this uh, this friend and and help her out when she needed help. And so, um, yes, real things matter. Real people matter. People that we can be together with in, you know, physically. Mm-hmm. You know, that that all matters. Not to say that, you know, I work with people that I've never met in person. And I feel like I have some kind of a relationship yep. with them because we meet so often. But, um, you know, would if I could bring them all together uh, in my town and we could all just work from an office. Yeah, I'd actually I'd actually uh, like that, mm-hmm. you know, so there's awesome things to technology and i never want to like be one of these like oh just ban all technology but i would say that you know if there's one thing you might want to consider doing with your family um or for yourself is just doing a a, a fast like a digital mm-hmm. fast mm-hmm. where you kind of you know for like yeah. seven days i know of people that go like 30 days you know that would be hard for me but um i've done it for mm-hmm. seven um, where I've, uh, well, especially with social media and the effects are so positive. You know, they have teens that do this and they're like, oh my yeah. gosh, I love it. They go out to these wilderness things and they, they, they really feel this, their, their mental health mm-hmm. improves and they feel unburdened. So I'll just say that starting with like a, a fast, this, you know, in the summer, 
And then making sure that when you bring your kids back, uh, that you give them some digital safety mm -hmm. training mm -hmm. before. I think that would be a perfect combination of, you know, what you can do to improve the digital health and the digital safety of your kids and the mental health. Excellent. Love that advice. Some very actionable next steps. Kristen, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Yeah. I know you're also, quickly, I just want to add, you're on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, um, at Defend Young Minds, also in the show notes. Lot, lots of show notes this time. Be linking to studies and articles and all kinds of good yeah. stuff. Um, thanks for coming on, and uh, I look forward to having you back. Thanks so much, Christian. 